So, Michael, chat to me about your background in sport development. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, my name's Mike Feely. I am a sports development scientist. I graduated from the University of East London in 2012. Um, I got a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in sports development. And basically, um, I went to college next to the Olympics. And, and essentially, I studied the Olympics. Um, from a governmental side, it would be, you would call it maybe mega event policy and practice. Um, I was more focused on coaching and development and talent ID. So when I graduated, I did, uh, I got a postgraduate certificate in performance coaching from uh, the University of Stirling because I was more focused on that, just wanted to be a coach. But also what sports development talks about is um, in particular with the Olympics was um, legacy impact. So what do you leave behind when you have this event and you spend all this money on the stadium and um, bringing people there, you've got to make sure that they show up. The fans are there. So, so for example, the Blair government released uh, Sport in Future for All. That was a white paper that basically outlined what the Olympics was going to do for us and how they were going to back that up with government programs. And so you've got kind of the 30,000 foot view all the way down to the nuts and bolts coaching of youth programs to get kids engaged, how they learn, what coach and referee education pieces are there. Um, all kinds of stuff like that. And originally, um, I mean, originally I went to school to be a PE teacher, but I coached a women's rugby team in Toronto. Shout out to the Aurora Barbarians. Um, and it changed my life. And so when I got back after my first year, um, I dropped out of school and transferred to go and do uh, sports development at UEL. And um, I've been very fortunate. I've coached a lot of men and women's teams in the southeast of England, um, coached in Toronto. And um, coached here in Colorado. And so chat to me then about how you started looking into the sustainability of rugby as a professional sport. Um, well, I think the first part with it, it was kind of always in the back of my mind. And I had fell out with some people at my old rugby club, my home club, Beckenham, with with conversation. I didn't really understand why it bothered me, but but ultimately it it was from the Olympic point of view, like what do you leave behind? So if you leave it behind, is it a white elephant or is it operating? Meaning, is it sustainable? And so when you look at the Olympics, they create the event and they create all this programming and infrastructure to support participation growth because participation leads to fandom, um, stuff like that. And, and so then it was like, well, if the government isn't going to pay for this all the time, who is going to pay for it or how can we pay for it ourselves? And, and kind of what, what happened when I came to Colorado, I, I coached the Glendale Raptors women in 2014. Uh, we won a national championship and I asked for, a, for a, a proper salary. I mean, I wasn't probably the best person to employ at that point anyway. I was drinking and just not in a good, good headspace, so I don't really blame them. But the response was that women's rugby isn't commercially viable. And so that's why I wasn't getting paid to do the same work as the, men, the men's coach. And... Um, I just walked away and examined that thought and and or that that belief and and what I concluded was men's rugby isn't viable either. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, but ultimately I think the biggest part is we just spend money as a community, as a marketplace, um, as people in rugby. When whether whether we're we're members paying dues or or membership to your club, if we're buying kit and equipment individually or as teams or as clubs all it does is is that that money just leaves the ecosystem you might get a little bit back in terms of sponsorship or some sort of discount there's a lot of kit companies that do club shops for you and stuff like that but but at the end of the day that's something that you should sell yourselves and that was what I fell out with one one of the guys at my club about was why are we giving away the club shop we haven't given away the club bar and it's the same principle it's just a different revenue stream so once I sort of started thinking about past experiences and, and things that were going on in general and trying to tie that back to, well, why isn't it viable? What would make it viable? And revenue is ultimately money. What makes it viable? I started to examine where we were spending money. And basically I came up with um, the six pillars of revenue. Now there's actually eight, but I think that um, 
seven and eight or more assets and not necessarily revenue specifically, which would be data and land. But um, the six pillars of revenue, first and foremost, is membership dues. Second is Kima, which is kit, equipment, merchandise, and apparel. Um, third is uh, concessions. Then you've got advertising. Then you've got gate receipts and events. And gate receipts and events are, are separate because all games are events, but not all events are games. So it might be if you've got a stadium, you can have like Twickenham, for example, they have concerts. So it came down to just sort of breaking it down into how can we group these categories and then and then looking at, well, who's supplying those particular categories and stuff like that. And advertising includes sponsorship. More than anything, it's sponsorship, um, but it would include like web traffic ads and stuff like that as well. People are monetizing digital media more than ever. So that kind of all wraps into it. But But what I found was we don't own any of the supply chain. So, so when you think about like a Michelin star restaurant and their farm to table, they own the supply chain. They've, they've invested and partnered with the guy that's growing the, the crops that feed the cows. They've invested in the guy that's raising the cows. And then they've invested in the guy that's butchering and processing the cows and so on and so forth. So like really that sort of farm to farm to table concept is about owning the supply chain and, and guaranteeing quality versus quantity. But if you take the same principle for 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 sport, um, you know, just by participating, we already create a demand for the products we need just to play the game. So I use the example to play golf, you need golf clubs. So if you're creating a, a demand for people to play golf, you're creating a demand for golf clubs automatically. It's called the participation demand, product demand continuum. And I'm probably racing ahead, but... But basically, it's a continuum because one automatically leads to the other. And the follow up is if you've created that demand in a capitalist society, you're entitled to capture the revenue from its sale. And we don't. We let someone else sell it for us in return for uh, a poor licensing deal or or an undervalued sponsorship. Yeah. So you're saying that <clears throat> people who are playing rugby, they buy gear from Nike or Adidas and these different places and that money goes off to that Adidas Germany, Nike America and we buy our boots there as well and all that and then none of that money or very little of that money gets reinvested into rugby that Nike or Adidas might give a small sponsorship or, or give some sponsorship but it's small and comparative to the money that's leaving the game that's what you're saying. 100%, 100%. Nike actually is the largest sponsor of sport in the world. They spend $600 million a year on sponsorship. But they do that largely with, like, you know, star athletes because then that convinces the rest of us, oh, we've got to have that, you know, shiny new toy or keeping up with the Joneses, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it's no secret that star athletes are used for endorsements to sell products to us Everyone. basically and so you know that's one of the things i've always i've been trying to put out in terms of america um when i was 14 i was water boy for a second team game at beckenham and we had a guy playing called um nathan bombries he's actually the ceo of rugby canada now i uh, used to be at the worcester warriors uh, glasgow warriors um and I remember my mate saying oh he's from america and they're the sleeping giant and i just i've always been fascinated with that that whole concept you know even when I was doing my studies a lot of my friends went to Australia and New Zealand but I always came to North America um but like the sleeping giant isn't their athletic ability it's the consumer dollar and it's if we can harness that you know when they look and it, it's, it's absolutely the dollar because look at all the American money that's coming into into rugby now with people trying to invest in the URC or or premiership teams like like Worcester, they're backed um, potentially by American American financing. It's no different from, say, Todd Bowley just bought Chelsea. There, there's a lot more venture capital and a lot more interest in putting that venture capital into sports franchises from the US than a lot of other places, um, where you get the Middle East even. You know, we look at the uh, Manchester City fo football group and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, what I, what I realised and thinking about the sleeping giant or waking the giant or whoever that might be 
it, it came down to it's us. We're the sleeping giant, the people. And it's the money that we spend and what do we spend it on and how can we capture that and how can we point it back at something that would be useful to ourselves versus um, just keep giving it away. And, and one of the reasons I opened my pub, McMullen's, was to sort of prove that concept. And we were cash only and we got a lot of stick for that. But the idea was the principle that when you buy a drink and you pay cash at a bar, you get change. That change is leaving the cash register, right? And when you leave a dollar or two on the bar as a tip, that's money coming back or not leaving at all. And the way that tipped employees work in the US is that if it's 10 bucks an hour minimum wage, but you've made 10 bucks in tips, the business doesn't pay you 10 bucks. You've made your hourly rate through service. And so basically all the money that is leaving, the change with a tip coming back is no longer leaving. And that $2 that comes back every time someone gets served a drink or a dollar, as long as it meets the minimum $10 an hour, well, that's then subsidizing the cost of the operation of the business because I don't have to pay that 10 bucks in wages. They've already made it. Does that make sense? How does that relate to rugby? So coming back to owning the supply chain and all the money that we spend, if it's money coming out of the till or it's money coming out of our profit, out of our pocket, if we own part of the company that is supplying us or we own all of the company that is supplying us collectively, then that profit is ours. So at some point so, it's coming back. So you're saying, say, like the likes of the RFU should be should own their own uh, merchandise company or yeah. like their kit suppliers. So the England rugby and the different rugby unions should have their own brand and they should sell all the shorts and socks to all the clubs in the country to every uh, mini youth uh, grassroots player and they should all buy England rugby gear versus Adidas or Nike or Puma or Umbro or whatever and then 100% yeah. then yeah so then they own the supply chain in that regard and I get you and then so Moving it on. And it wouldn't be an England jersey. It's not about the logo on the Oh, left. no, I know what you mean. I know, I know what right. you mean. I know what you mean. So it will be, say, like, England Rugby set up a kit company called Eeyore, Eeyore or something or whatever. And it's instead of Nike, it's whatever. They set it up and they build warehouses and they do all of that jazz. And then and then they get that. I get you. So chat to you a bit about it. So uh, one or two of your posts about... Um, the how rugby isn't sustainable and something that me and just a lot of I think a lot of fans and people on the outside looking in or look are thinking you we're seeing clubs go bust so we're seeing wasps Worcester go under USA rugby went bust as well and then there's lots of unions that are in that are struggling right yep and there is a lot of talk about how attendances are going down I remember there last year, like seeing the Millennium Stadium with just loads of empty seats for an international. Is that a Friday whereas, night game? Yeah, whereas that just that wouldn't have chance? happened. Yeah, so that just wouldn't have happened. So um, you teams are going under. Uh, there's fewer fans in the stadium, yet every year players are signing bigger, bigger record deals. So players are getting paid more and more and more. And... It just it just doesn't make sense, really. Um, I mean, well, let me just finish the thought and I'll respond to that. So, so if that's true for the RFU, it's also true for the Scottish RFU, Welsh Rugby Union, the RFU, the FFR, NZRU, Rugby Australia, like USA Rugby, Argentina. Like we we're a union under World Rugby, like we all have the same issue and it'll, it'll benefit all of us in the same way if we just collectively shop and do business and, and own it together. Um, so that's something that's going to, you know, ultimately that's a huge mass scale project, but I don't know any sport that owns its own brand. Like as a collective and we, and we should, because like Nike and Adidas aren't sportswear anymore. They're just clothes. Not, you know, most people out there wearing clothes. Nike, Adidas, uh, Puma, whatever, um, as a fashion item. So, like, when you 
when you've got to that point and your brand is just closed, you haven't got to worry about it. And, and to that point, like the global sportswear market is 150 billion a year. It's going to be 260, 270 in the next five years, 260 billion a year. That's how it's going to increase versus right now, sports uh, TV rights is about 50 billion. Sponsorship is about 60 billion. So kit and equipment or sportswear is already worth more than the two that we're targeting combined. Um, to get back to the bit about um, players getting paid more, I think it's the tail wagging the dog. You know, I like watching the rugby pod, Jim Hamilton all the time. Yes, rugby players should be paid more. You say, well, why? Because we got to pay the bills. Yes, Jim, you do. What about the fans? What about the people buying the ticket? They've got to pay the bills as well. And at some point when when prices are, uh, are beyond what is recognised as good values, people stop showing up. And when people stop showing up, clubs start losing money, people get laid off, or, or, the, or the club folds. And that's what's happened with, with Wor uh, Worcester and Wasps. Um, and it, you know, it happened in the past with Rotherham Titans. It's happened in the past with Welsh provinces and stuff like that, where if, if, the, con if, if the business is paying you more than it can afford, to sustain sustainably pay you, then you're not an asset, you're a liability. And you should be, uh, for the sake of the business, you, you need to be let go. Um, but instead of doing that, they, they, set, they put out more jerseys, more, more apparel, more merch, uh, merchandise, um, ticket prices go up, you're getting gouged at the stadium because it's $12 for a beer or, I mean, what's it? I don't know. I'm saying dollars because I live in America now, but like say it's eight, nine pound a pint versus high street price of four or five. So if you think about a business that or a startup that is failing, quite often the, the shareholders, there's a capital call, right? You've got to put more money in to keep it going, to keep it trying to grow. Well, the fans aren't shareholders, even though they're probably the biggest stakeholder group. Um, but they're the ones being called on for the increase in capital every year. And they're getting less and less to show for it, which over time just erodes, first of all, trust. Second of all, um, the value proposition. So when you're sitting at Twickenham watching England versus Argentina, it's a good game or a boring game, depending on your perspective. Um, I'm sure a few paddies were cheering for the RGs, but anyway, um, it, it, it just... You know, you pay £200 for a ticket or £150 for a ticket. You've got your travel card. That's not cheap anymore to get to the game. Then you're going to spend money all day. Like, instead of it being a £100 day out, you're now looking at a £300 day out. For some people, that's just too much. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not worth it. And, and that's where we're, we're coming to in the fact that, first of all, we've, we've milked the fans dry so they've stopped coming. And then on the other side of it, when you look at long-term athlete development theory sort of influencing our decision-making about economics and where to put resources and where to invest, we've continued to pull it all into this central column and try to raise it as high as we can. Um, it's like a game of Jenga, but we've eroded the sides of the sports development pyramid. And what that means is the base, which is grassroots community clubs. You know, there's a 30 to 40% reduction in, in England right now of men's club rugby participation. And that's not been a trend that's new. That's been sort of, it's been accelerated by COVID, but it's, it's been happening for the last probably decade. And where winning becomes the focus and match fees and then bringing in foreigners and stuff like that, even community clubs are, are not really doing a good enough job of sustaining and promoting the youth that are supposed to come through in the first place. And it, if, you, if you multiply that by 2,000 clubs, that's a lot of people dropping out of the game or not staying in the game long enough to become lifelong fans. So like we, we need to do a better job of, of getting more youngsters playing. Um, we need to do a better job of keeping them long enough that, that they're going to be fans as adults. And, and we need to do a better job of providing those adults with value for money. It's, you know, we're, at the end of the day, we're in a business where we're selling entertainment. And, you know, a cinema ticket is still 15 bucks, even though the movies are costing 10 times as much to make than 50 years ago or 20 years ago, 
it's still 10 or 15 bucks. If you get above, say, $25, $30, people just stop going to the movies. And it's no different with, with rugby. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, and you make great points there. And I love all rugby. I love the grassroots game. I love the pro game. Like, you know, I want it all to rise up, and I want, you know, the sport to thrive. But I see what you mean with the price of going to games. And, like, I went to my old club recently, Lansdowne, and it was a fiver in. I went to two games. It was a fiver in, and me and my brother and my dad went to another game, and both games were like five tries each or six tries to five. And it was just the most incredible rugby. Like my brother's more of a Gaelic football person. He lo- likes watching rugby too, but he was just like, man, that was just unreal. Like it was just end to end. It was like incredible. And if you're comparing entertainment value to an international game, once again, sorry, let me give an anecdote, but I wasn't at the game, but my brother, and my dad went to the Ireland South Africa game. And this brother, who isn't a 100% diehard rugby person, but enjoys watching it, he went to the game and he said, he said, Brian, every minute there was stoppages, the water people were coming on. And it was like, I I don't want to see that. And then dad's like, oh, the South Africans, you know, they want to slow the game down and they're big men and whatever, whatever. But it's like the fan, the casual fan who went and paid 120 euro or 100 and whatever it is, was just like, this is kind of boring to be stop, 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 stop. Whereas that same person came with me to the club rugby game, which is, you know, those guys are training, you know, tons and just said how exciting it was. And it's just interesting. You talk about the value proposition and how the fans have been milked dry. So talk to me, though, about CVC. And so the the outside money coming in. So like, what does that mean? Because once again, we see Premiership Rugby, they're all losing money. Every team is losing money. WRU are talking about cutting regions. Scotland have already cut regions in the past. The Prem, I think Extra used to be the only team that are making money. I'm not sure if they still are, but literally just every team just loses money every year. And now CVC, this um, big venture capital firm, are buying up parts of the premiership they're buying up uh the six nations they're they're kind of buying it up so what does that mean for rugby and what's the story there um i it means we as a community own less of the thing that we built um i i i personally i'm i'm look, i'm not against making a profit we need to make a profit so that we can reinvest and grow that's just necessary but um, I'm, I'm disappointed with the way that um, private equity has been courted and, and sort of delivered to the game. Um, CVC invested, they own, they, they own 27%, I believe, of, um, well, it was Pro 14, which is now the United Rugby Championship. They own 27% of Premiership Rugby. They own 20%, or they're a one-seventh, I think they own 20% of the rights, but they're definitely a one one seventh shareholder in the Six Nations. Um, Silver Lake own, I think, 12% of the All Blacks commercial rights. Um, you know, for 100 years, the New Zealand rugby community has supported and invested in New Zealand rugby to produce All Blacks, whether it's a volunteer sweeping the sheds at a local club, they're contributing to the All Blacks. Right. And they, that's that's gone on for 100 years. And because it wasn't run properly and the, because the union needed money, they've sold something that really didn't belong to them. It belonged to the members and the members should have been asked. But no one asked them. They asked they asked the membership <clears throat> in terms of the provincial unions or the provincial unions leadership. Um, but they were all in the same boat. They had lo- they were losing money. They were desperate for money, the same as New Zealand rugby was. And so now you've got someone show up, well, look, here's some money to cover your losses. We're going to spin it to the public that this is all about growth. But really, it's just trying to erase some of the debt. So if you look at CBC, they put 200 million into Premiership Rugby. They took 27% for the last two years, uh, took 27% equity. So for the last, I think, what I can't remember the article where I read it, but it was basically 300 million pound losses over the last six years. That's the premiership rugby. Um, 
you'll notice that that's coincided as well when they expanded the salary cap and and the number of marquee players, um, amongst other things. But basically, that's a fifty million pound a year loss, and and that's consistent. So for six years they've done that. I don't anticipate that changing. For the last two years, um, roughly 27 million of that 50 million pound loss was money going back to CVC. So the way that, and, and, and a lot of people were sort of like, oh, look at what they did in F1 and this, that, and the other. But um, there's also some criticism of CVC in terms of what they did with Formula One. And not really asset stripping in the traditional sense, but sort of, partitioning as in they've got their chunk of equity right that 27 percent will never be owned by premiership rugby or the clubs again um but for 200 million uh 27 and a half million return for the last two years if they do that for another six years that recoups the 200 million dollars or 200 million pounds it gives them a 10 percent return on 20 million of 20 million on top of that Plus, they still own the 27% equity, which they'll then turn around and sell. In the meantime, Premiership Rugby and the clubs are still losing 50 million a year. So in eight years, CVC will have recouped the 200 million plus 10% plus 27% equity. At the same time that that happens, the Premiership clubs, assuming that they still lose 50 million a year, will have accrued another 400 million pound in losses. That to me is not a good deal in any way you shake it. And, and the fact that you own less of your assets that you're trying to increase the value of to recoup the revenue um, just makes it more difficult. So they either undervalued it, meaning they, they should have given them much less equity, or they should have asked for less money to give up less equity to give themselves a better chance to, to be able to pay it off or buy it back out and so on. But they, they're never going to do it. And, and that is because they're not targeting all the revenue streams that are available to them, that they're, they're overly reliant on one or two. And, and like I was telling you off, off recording, like with my pub, once you're overly reliant on a single revenue stream, your business is really going to struggle. Yeah. And <coughs> the, I think it's just, it seems like, you know, keeping up with the Joneses that none of these unions are willing to, um, reel it in a little that it's just you know spend more and more and more and you know i wonder i don't know japan and france are often talked about because there's so much money there and i think for i don't know but i it looks like france kind of do it right or they've got a big tv deal but they've got lots of um support they seem to fill out stadiums a lot um i think france do okay but then the likes of england and these other places um they're just spend more and more and more to try and keep up with the salaries in France and Japan and then just go bust. Whereas mm. why not just, you look at them, um, I think you mentioned it, or I don't know where I saw it, but um, Arsenal and Arsene Wenger. And yeah. my, once again, my brother and dad are Arsenal fans and they were, you know, very frustrated. Well, but Yeah, but they were, you know, frustrated. But when um, Wenger was there, it was like, we can't break the budget. And they were trying to compete with less resources than Fergie's Man United and Abramovich. And they did compete, and I'm not sure how they're doing it now, but they didn't want to break it because they're building a new stadium. So it wasn't just, oh, they're paying a player, paying 50 million for a player. Let's we go pay 50 million. And I'm talking about 10, 15 years ago now. It's way more. But it was, it's just interesting that they kept everything in check whereas it seems with rugby oh they're giving a player 500 grand we need to give a player 500 grand but we're losing millions every year and there's no one coming in the gates doesn't matter just give it to them yeah um it's interesting and i mean i I grew up in london i'm a chelsea fan um i love premier league football and it, it we won't know um for another 10 or 15 years but basically by the time um, Jurgen Klopp or Guardiola are, are gone and we've had, and, and retired and whatever, and it might be 20 years, they're both young. We'll have the same sort of perspective that we can look back at, at Ferguson uh, for Man United or Wenger for Arsenal right now. And, you know, Fergie's the, 
Ver Fergie's one of my all-time idols um, because he was always, first of all, no one's bigger than the club, and second, it's about the fans. Um, but you could argue that Wenger was a more successful manager, less trophies, um, but based on the fact that the business broke even. You know, Manchester United were losing money. Now, some of that you can talk about the Glazers, the ownership, the way they debt financed it and were, you know, been taking dividends. And, and Gary Neville talks about that a lot. But mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, um, you, you've got to be able to play. You, you, you want to win this year, but is winning this year more important than being able to play next year? So if you can't play next year at all because you've, you've, you've gone broke, winning this year ain't that important. So it's about perspective as well, really. What, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, and, the, and the reason that's a bit different, maybe um, more so for Guardiola than Jurgen Klopp, you know, Liverpool have American ownerships, the Red Sox guys, but they seem to have always been a little bit more sustainable in that sense versus breaking the bank kind of, let's all go and spend, spend, spend. But, you know, I, I just... We, we define success so narrowly that, you know, Ferguson was always better than Wenger. But when you look at it and say, well, hold on a second, Wenger did this, this and this, and, and here's what stayed afterwards and so on. You know, at this point in time, Arsenal are going from strength to strength to strength versus Manchester United are at the end of a 10, 12 year slump in a rebuild. Well, Arsenal already got that done. And they've got a new stadium and they haven't got to try and sell or be bought out or, or, or fund a new stadium the same way that Manchester United are currently trying to do. Yeah. I, I just see a lot more problems for Manchester United uh, in, the, in the coming years in that sense than versus, say, Arsenal. So it's cyclical and, and it's also just, you know, how are we define in success. I think we, we, we've got too narrow a vision of that. 100% yeah it's interesting last one on the soccer <laughs> but, uh, football um but yeah it's interesting the kind of comparison there with CBC and with Man United so when the Glazers bought Man United they leveraged did a leverage buyout so they they he put huge debt onto the club and then the hey, club yeah so Man United was never in debt in its whole history and then all of a sudden they have huge debts that are rising, rising, rising all the time to where now it's got to a point that it's it can ne nearly never be pulled back. And they've just pulled so much money out of it. The Glaziers has pulled so much money out of it. And now they're just going to sell it, set off back to America. And Man United is in financial ruin. And it's like, yeah, yeah of course, you they, you know, maybe some really richer person or whatever will come in, but it's in financial ruin. Whereas before that, it was a very, very, very well-run club for 150 odd years. And so where, come back to rugby, but where do you think it goes? Like, where does professional rugby go? If they keep doing what they're doing, um, down the drain, down the drain. Um, and it, it seems sort of very, very pessimistic, but we, we should be realistic that in 25 years of operating Premier League rugby or Premiership rugby rather, um, or just over 25 years of professionalism, and I know COVID was an issue, but then that affected everyone. Um, they've lost over half a billion dollars or pounds rather. Um, okay, there's... But say there's 10 teams, 25 years, right? That's 250 opportunities for each one to make a profit as an outlet or a franchise of that corporation, which is the league. Um, in that time frame, I think only three clubs have ever posted a profit. One of them was Bristol, and that was after uh, the CVC money came in. So they readjusted the books and their loss went, it went from a loss to a profit. Um, it, if we if we don't start, like I said, there's the six pillars of revenue and, and we're focused on tickets, concessions and TV money. So we're not really we're not really maximizing sponsorships in, 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 in that kind of subcategory of advertising. Um, and we're not capitalizing at all on the largest segment, which is kit and equipment. 
um, you know, again, right, to play golf, you need golf clubs. And I posted before, like it says in the Bible, if you, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. The participation demand product, uh, product demand continuum dictates that you've now created a market for fishing rods and reels and bait and waders and anything else that goes into it. Like when I say we need to sell stuff collectively to each other and own our own supply chain, how many rugby clubs around the world still line the fields or mark the pitch with white paint? The Nearly major, every single yeah. one of them. So, so it would benefit all of us if we all owned a piece of the company that was supplying us with the paint that we're consuming. Yeah, World Rugby or if World Rugby owned it or something. Or, yeah. Well, it's you have to be careful. It's not, we, we can't central. I'm not talking about centralizing the ownership in the sense that like, you know, that's state communism, basically. I'm talking about a cooperative where it's collective ownership um, at various levels by individuals, by the teams, the clubs, the unions, and so on, all the way through. Um, <clears throat> but, but ultimately it just comes back, that gives us bargaining power. If we can purchase stuff in greater quantities, we get a better price. If we still then consume it at retail or just discounted at retail, we're saving money on the back end. We're saving money on the front end. But in between is the margin of profit, which we can then redistribute to ourselves. And whether that comes out um, as a check and you put the money in the bank, or if that comes back as here's a coupon for 100 balls because you've got this much credit in your, in your account. That's 100 balls you haven't got to find the cash for, for your youth, to, your youth program. Instead, that might be a couple grand that goes towards um, more coach and referee education. So you've got people to provide and sustain the program because the balls have been paid for. Or you can take all of this and wrap it up in a package like we have with Citizen Sports, which is we sell sponsorships to small businesses or big businesses, and we try to structure it that someone at, at the top is going to get sponsorship but it's also going to feed down to the teams below it so that we're funding the, the, the pyramid, the farm system. And it, it just comes back to like, we have to find different or better ways or, or unique ways to, to capture revenue that we're already trying to capture. We're just doing it inadequately. So England getting a million pound from Umbro, but Umbro then selling 5 million pounds worth of jerseys, England jerseys. Um, What's better? Yeah. Because because Umbro isn't paying five million pounds for those jerseys that they sell. So somewhere in there is profit. How much and, and where it comes from and where it goes is up to us. But we're just going along the same way, the same way, the same way. It's like the economy, right? Boom and bust, boom and bust, boom and bust. We get milked, it falls apart, they give a bit back, we start again. It's like a game of Monopoly that never ends. Yeah, it seems it seems with professional rugby just <clears throat> that yeah, if it keeps going the way it's going, CVC will own a hundred percent, and uh, are these companies will own a hundred percent, and then there'll be a complete disconnection from the grassroots to the professional, and it could go kind of like the NFL, and and while that might seem somewhat cool or F one, but we all started playing rugby at our club and in our school. And I don't think it's great that you can see it, the disconnection between professional rugby and the grassroots game. It is getting more and more. It is becoming more disconnected, I think. And yeah, then like you say, with grassroots numbers going down and if, if we keep going the way we're going, yeah, CVC own a hundred percent they can milk it as much as they want and then the grassroots goes down and down then all of a sudden you have nobody playing like nfl again yeah you've nobody playing rugby after the age of 22 you or you know you go to college you play rugby or if you don't make it at 18 you stop playing rugby and that's kind of happening but yeah it's 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 not good um it really 
I'm glad you brought up the NFL because a lot of people talk about it all the time and look how much money they're making. Again, not understanding all the revenue streams that are available, not understanding the context in which they operate, sports structures, commercial structures, or anything like that of the US. Um, the NFL isn't responsible for a single piece of its talent pathway. So community programs like we have pirate youth sports we 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 started a pilot rugby program they have a flag football program it's all run by volunteer parents paid for by the parents so and kids show up etc that's elementary and middle school level um of those kids that are active at that age group in all sports 70 percent drop out by the time they get to middle school which is about 12 12 years old excuse me um so then all of a sudden, it's great narrowing of, of participation, huge reduction. That would be a good spot for rugby to target is, is middle school. We don't necessarily need the six-year-olds. Let's go pick up the 12-year-olds that have already had enough with all the other sports. Um, and, and I've always said, like, rugby is a second or last chance for Americans or North Americans to participate in meaningful amateur competition because we say, yes, you can play, not, sorry, you're not good enough. Um, but that's what happens in, in, in American sport. And so when you get to um, high school, you have junior varsity and varsity. So of, of a school of, say, 2,000 kids, you might have 50 guys on the JV and 50 guys on the varsity team. And that's it. Everyone else is there to watch. This is also why Americans are so fat. We're a nation of spectators. We don't take part. We don't play. We just watch and consume. And there's all kinds of ways that's been monetized and that revenue gets captured. TV, money, Doritos, Budweiser, pizza getting delivered, whatever it is. And you see it with all the people that are advertising mm. during the games. They, they have an interest in that. But you get from high school, you then get offers to go and play on a scholarship at a D1 college. If you're D3, um, odds are you're not really going to join the NFL, right? So you might go find another sport, particularly rugby or something. But you go high school, JV, varsity, collegiate varsity, professional. Um, all the high school sport is funded by us, the taxpayers. All the facilities are paid for by us, the taxpayers, because it's in the schools. There's no community clubs where you own your own land with pitches and a clubhouse. It's all done by parks and recs departments and managed uh, through city governments. Um, college programs. You know, Nick Saban is the highest paid employee of the state of Alabama. How can a football coach be paid more than like, a doctor or the chief of police or someone like that? That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, we, again, taxpayers or students that are then overpaying on their tuition fees, overpaying on the interest on the loans of their tuition fees and so on and so forth. And it's this whole just this whole system is designed to suck as much money out of the base into a very small funnel and, and lift it all the way to the top. Well, again, it's, it's like a game of Jenga. And that's why the economy keeps collapsing. That's why rugby teams keep going out of business. And that's why we've got no infrastructure at the grassroots because we keep giving the people above us all our money. Um, the reason they have a draft in the NFL is because they're not in control of any of their talent pathway as well. So it's not, oh, this is entertaining or this is about keeping it a level playing field. It's that it's impossible to recruit talent any other way because they don't own the players. It's not the same as, say, Saracen's Academy. Um, it's also where <clears throat> if you're completely detached from, from youth sport, you're not collecting any memberships or revenue that way uh, over time. So when you get to the when you get to the NFL and when you get to a game, you have to extract as much as you can in as short a time as you can. You know, Mile High Stadium for the Denver Broncos, they only have eight home games a year. Yes, there's 60,000 people, but only eight times. So how do you make money elsewhere? Um, I, I think some sort of hybrid model would be good for rugby, where you 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 look at sort of a US farm system more based on on, on baseball. Um, again, that comes down to sort of trust and structure and operating standards and things like that, which are completely lacking anyway. But 
versus say Barcelona or Chelsea Academy or Soccer Academy, um, <coughs> excuse me, where, you know, they're starting really young. They're picking up six, seven, eight year olds. I think that's too young for rugby. I don't think, you, I don't think that's necessary. Um, but basically, if, if, we, if we instead leave players where they're at, um, we could try and monetize it a certain way. But again, again, coming back, like, rugby, before any of that as well, football is played in every school. High school, right? American football is played in every high school. Rugby isn't played in every school in England. Rugby isn't played in every school in Ireland. So that's something we need to fix first because you've got to have that base. And, and if you look at um, the, the total number of football clubs in England, it's about 40,000 versus 2,000 in, in uh, rugby clubs. Like, we're nowhere near. So we shouldn't even be thinking about stadium sizes, salaries, um, endorsements, and things like that, uh, that come close to football, soccer, um, unless we have some sort of model that, that connects everyone. And I think that when we talk about the NFL, we completely misunderstand the structure that makes it successful. We completely misunderstand the context in which it operates. And it's a pipe dream. We need to do our own thing and find solutions that work in, in multiple ways. It, it's not... Um, it's not going to happen overnight either. And this is where they keep going for TV money, the quick buck, and, and versus the long, the long play, which is investing in the grassroots. Yeah. I waffled a bit there, sorry. No, 100%. And where you got to there, um, I think that's what everyone, everyone thinks is what needs to be done is the investment in the grassroots. Yeah, is getting more people playing. And that's where, you know, you mentioned at the start the volunteer sweeping the sheds with the all blacks analogy and you go to clubs like there's incredible volunteers like even i see my local club and um yeah it's that's the work that those are the people that need to be supported more and more and to get people out into the community to get people playing rugby and yeah those people need to be supported more versus like a player getting paid a million pounds you know yeah, a player getting paid a million pounds. Like, is it not okay to get paid five hundred thousand? And then that five hundred thousand goes to pay how many salaries? You could get probably fifteen or twenty salaries to go around to all the schools. So the player is still getting paid huge money, and then you get twenty people out in all these different schools, and the game grows and grows and grows versus not having the money to get people out into the schools and the clubs, sorry, you know, out into the, yeah, the high schools and clubs and all this, but then the player just gets another hundred thousand, another 200,000 and, you know, more and more and more. And people then make the argument, I think that, oh, well, you know, these players need to maximize their earnings, blah, blah, blah. But like everyone else plays rugby too. It's like the guy playing the club rugby is playing rugby and the guy playing international or professional is playing rugby. So it's like, and I, I chat to, you know, chat to some of my friends who play professionally and they're like, man, it's unreal. Like I get paid to do it. And if I wasn't playing here, should I be back with my club? I'd be playing rugby anyway. You know, like they're just lads that love playing rugby. So, you know, I don't know. Well, I always come back and so Jim Hamilton keeps saying it and you hear it a lot on, on sports radio here when they talk about it, but without the players, there is no game. Um, true, but not true. Like, like you said, if if they're not getting paid to play, then they'll just be down the club yeah. locally. So there is still a game, right? Um, my question would be, well, first of all, without the players, there is no game. Without the fans, there is no business. So where do fans come from? Two thirds of all fans were or are rugby players. Um, so again, without without the players, there is no game. That's right. But But which players are you talking about? And and that's where you come back to um I don't know what's the one with it? Napoleon the pig, some pigs are more equal than others. Mm, I can't that's, what's that? Is that nineteen uh, not nineteen eighty four? Well, animal that, farm. Animal farm, that's it. Yeah, George you know, Orwell. Some pigs are more equal than that. Well, that's fine, but uh, that's that's an extraction based model. It's like 
fossil fuels versus renewable energies, right? At some point, the ecosystem dies. Or you see it where, I'm oh, a bit of a history nerd, sometimes I'll go down a YouTube rabbit hole watching documentaries and stuff, and it's like a, an apex predator dies out because it's eaten all its prey, or the numbers are drastically reduced. You know, at some point, it affects the, the thing at the top because it's damaged its ecosystem, its environment so much that, that it's fatal to its ecosystem and therefore terminal to its own survival. So basically, at some point, like world rugby, you know, I, I think a lot of this started when things like the RFU or, what, or, or the IRB became brands, right? They became a brand instead of a service organization. At the end of the day, it's supposed to do what it says on the tin, which is rugby football union. You're union first. So a union is there to serve the collective benefit of the memberships. How does it do that? Different conversation. But one of the things it will use to serve that function is, is collective bargaining. We apply that collective bargaining, say the USA rugby to insurance. So the players have insurance in case they get injured. And we can have a different conversation about the quality of that insurance. But they don't apply that to other elements, such as kit and equipment, uh, travel, education, stuff like that, where we can get it all cheaper. And even to the extent that I was talking about as well, what if we then own the company that's doing that as well, where we're recouping all of the profit? <coughs> um, Forgot where I was going with that. No, brilliant. Um, and I liked the analogy with the apex predator, uh, just eating all the prey and then there's nothing left. And just tying it back to the, when you're saying the fans being kind of priced out um, and not being able to milk it anymore, it's it's interesting. No, a lot of uh, great stuff there. And thanks so much for your time. I got a got a head on, unfortunately, but um. Thanks for your time, Michael. Really, really enjoyed it. And yeah, some really fascinating, interesting stuff there. I know I'm a bit out there sometimes, but I uh, would love to do it again. Appreciate you having me. Cheers. Cheers, Brian.